reading from the Anointed Church, sort of third article, Essology, by Gregory J. Liston, reading from a Chancedonian Spirit Christology, that chapter. There's neither the Son nor the Spirit can be neglected. Proposition 1. Although Jesus Christ is fully and uniquely the person of the Son and fully and uniquely anointed by the Spirit, the Chalcedonian Creed affirms that our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, one and the same Son, and only begotten God, the Word, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The pivotal point established in these creedal clauses is that Jesus Christ is one person, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. But having two natures identified as a divine nature, according to the Godhead, and a human nature, according to the manhood, the first spirit Christology proposition divides into two clauses, the first of which simply restates this one person, point of the Chalcedonian Creed. The, the second clause, which parallels the first, emphasizes the complementary recognition that the Spirit dwells within Christ, and that the Son's incarnation cannot be understood or explained without acknowledging His anointing by the Spirit at a basic and foundational level. As Dale Cole writes, he quotes, who Jesus Christ is and the salvation that He brings proceeds from a basic and foundational pneumatological orientation, which is end quote. On what basis do Del Cole and other advocates of spirit Christology make such a claim? Consider the challenges that arise when the Son's incarnation is understood without any reference to the Spirit and exclusive Logos Christology. Such an understanding has Jesus revealing God to humanity substantially he is God in the flesh, and because of this substantial hypostatic union, our salvation can and should be understood as genuinely ontological. The challenge comes when such an exclusive Logos Christology, which defines Jesus' divinity solely through the Son without any reference to the Spirit, tries to reconcile its ontological understanding with the biblical accounts of Christ, of Jesus' act activity. Consider some of Jesus' more obvious supernatural actions. How on earth did Jesus do miracles, control nature, and resist temptation? If he utilized the resources of his divine nature directly, then he has not experienced our condition. He is not fully human, but according to an, ex an exclusive Logos Christology, Jesus has, by definition, no other divine resource to draw on. <clears throat> an exclusive Logos Christology um, is thus not com capable of providing a comprehensive explanation for how divinity and humanity function within Jesus. Being, being exclusively a theology from above, it understands that the God-man is purely ontological terms, in, in purely ontological terms, but neglects his activity. The core problem is that Jesus' divinity is fully contained and explained in the hypostatic union between his human and divine nature, with the latter defined only as the Son's divine nature, but this single divine reality within Jesus proves inadequate to explain how such a hypostatic union is feasible. If Jesus' actions were, or were achieved, even partly by directly employing the divine resources of His Sonship, then precisely to that degree His humanity is denied. In any simplistically bipolar interaction, Jesus' divinity overwhelms His humanity with an unavoidable docetic result. Given these Christologies that deny or neglect the genuineness of the Spirit within the person of Jesus can be grouped under a category labeled as Spirit Docetism. This error is to deny or neglect the Spirit, but their inevitable result is to minimize Christ's humanity. Many theologians argue that following Chalcedon, the accepted Christological position swung too far towards what I am, uh, what I am terming a spirit docetism. As Rosado asserts, he quotes them saying, Had spirit Christology's weakness not been so exaggerated, its strengths, I mean, its strength would have remained a permanent legacy 
the later Christological treatises of classical scholastic and Protestant theology, end quote. Some, for example, see evidence of this tendency in the writings of Antonatius. Given his historical context, this eminent theologian's significant emphasis on the Son was entirely justified as a necessary defense of orthodoxy. But viewed ahistorically and particularly on the basis of our current post-mortem context, some question whether his emphasis on the Son leads to an underemphasis on the Spirit and a consequent diminu uh, diminution of Christ's humanity. Antonius certainly affirmed the genuine humanity of Jesus, but it is argued by some that he does not give an adequate account of it. For example, Antonius does not consider the implication of Christ having a human soul and consequently appears incapable of accounting for the ignorance, emotions, agony, and suffering of Jesus. Mrs. Gunton argues similarly, and you go to him saying, while it is unfair, for example, to charge Antonius with anticipations of Apollinaris, his language is undoubtedly unguarded at times, as when, for example, he speaks of the word as wielding his body like an implement. The humanity of Jesus lacks historical particularity in Antonius. End quote. While these critiques of Antonius have some merit, his emphasis on the Logos was at least partly a justified response to early spirit Christologies, which tended towards the opposite error of denying the person of the Son in the Incarnation from early adoptionist proposals. For example, Diotus, uh, Diodotus, the elder who characterized Christ as merely an inspired man through to the much more new Christologies of the Antiochene school. For example, Theodora Mastustia, who qualitatively distinguished between gods indwelling in Christ and humans. The key feature of early spirit Christologies was that Jesus' divinity was interpreted solely through the category of the indwelling spirit of God. Uh, these early the the theologians claimed that Jesus was the man in whom God dwelt, and accordingly that he was the man who, uniquely among other humans, turned himself fully to God, God's indwelling presence. We have understandings that define Jesus' divinity solely through the Son are described as exclusive Logos Christologies, and these early understandings may be described as exclusive Spirit Christologies, as they define Jesus' divinity so slowly, uh, solely through the Spirit, and thus deny or neglect the place of the Son in the Incarnation. Certainly such an understanding has some positive features. It matches the scriptural description of Jesus being prompt and enabled by the Spirit, and so provides a natural explanation for Jesus' spiritual development, uh, together with an exemplary path to follow in imitating Jesus' submission to God's presence. But an exclusive Spirit Christology has two significant and essentially irresolvable challenges. Uh, the first is that it requires Jesus, the man, to exist first, with God indwelling him, either chronologically or logically after. Uh, this implies the existence of two distinct persons within Jesus, effectively two sons of God, traditional Nestorianism. The second challenge is revealed in the question, why Jesus? What is it that makes Jesus the man in whom God specifically dwells? Why is it the specific human open and obedient to God's presence? in contrast to the rest of us. The only way these questions can be answered is by endowing the man, Jesus, with some unique and interesting, interesting God-like uh, characteristics, precisely that which an exclusive spirit Christology denies by definition. So the core problem of, with an exclusive spirit Christology is that it, under, it understands and explains the God-man Jesus based entirely on his activity. It is a theology developed purely from below. While this approach is necessary and important, it is in inadequate on its own as a theology purely from above. To fully understand Jesus, we have to explain not just what he did, but who he was. And Jesus must be ontologically God for salvation to be understood ontologically, as the biblical witness indicates it should. Uh, many proponents of an exclusive spirit Christology explicitly and not implicitly start from an a priori assumption that Jesus' ontological humanity precludes his ontological divinity. Consequently, Jesus' divinity is understood as an inspirational presence rather than an intrinsic ontological nature. 
God's spirit indwells a pre-existing man rather than God's son being hypostatically united to a human nature, a nature that and hypostatically have no existence before the union. So that Moltmann compellingly expresses, so he quotes them, saying, Incarnation has no presuppositions and habitation presupposes human existence. That incarnation is identified with him in habitation. Christology is dissolved into anthropology. Uh, end quote. An exclusive spirit Christology thus leads directly and inevitably to traditional Ebionism in that it fails to adequately account for Jesus' full ontological divinity. Given this Christology is that deny or neglect, the genuineness of the Son within the person of the Jesus can be grouped into a category labeled uh, spirit Ebionism. Uh, Ebionism. Their fundamental, their fundamental error is to deny or neglect the reality of the Son in Christ, but the inevitable result is to minimize Christ's divinity. Interestingly, the last few decades have seen in Renaissance, not just in spirit Christology, proposals that embrace Chalcedon and Trinitarian theology, but also several that go much further by arguing that spirit Christology should not complement but replace local Christology. Uh, their motivation arises from thinking that post-modernity finds an indwelling spirit more accessible and tightable than an incarnate son. It says uh, Roger Haight, for example, writes, he quotes them saying, by a spirit Christology, I mean one that explains how God is present and active in Jesus and thus views his divinity by using the biblical symbol of God as spirit and not the symbol of Logos, end quote. The parallels between early spirit Christologies and this later Renaissance run, run very deep, and as such, these modern proposals can also be grouped under the heading of spirit ebionism in attempting to replace the category of logos with the category of spirit in the person of jesus this stream of researchers essentially replicates the errors of the early church and its initial spirit christological explorations openly openly rejecting the chalcedonian and nicene formulations they invite the same critique and suffer from the same flaws as their, as their early church counterparts to fully understand Jesus' identity neither the spirit nor the son can be denied or neglected the first spirit Christology, Christological proposition thus argues that Jesus' identity cannot be understood simply by examining the, the relationship between his divine and human natures. These two categories, when viewed exclusively, as are, are neither adequate nor complete. A third category is needed. More specifically, the divine category needs to be divided into two separate realities, the Son and the Spirit, and Christ's ontology. Ontology needs to be expressed not only in how each of these relates to Jesus' human nature, but also in how they relate to each other. Taking the insights of spirit Christology seriously means Trinitarian theology needs to be thoroughly integrated into Christology so that the doctrine of the immanent Trinity accurately informs our apprehension of the incarnate Son. As for the first proposition, affirms our Lord Jesus Christ is fully and uniquely the person of the Son and fully and uniquely anointed by the Spirit. And it says, without priority, without confusion, without separation. And then uh, Proposition 2, within the incarnation, that the identity and missions of the Son and the Spirit are logically and chronologically synchronous, without priority, distinct, without confusion, and interdependent, without separation. <laughs> Once the relatively simplistic errors that deny the reality of the Spirit or the Son within the Incarnation are rejected, the question turns to how the identities and missions of the Spirit and the Son interact within the Incarnation. If an exclusive Logos Christology has an adequate ontology, ontology but an inadequate understanding of Christ's activity, and an exclusive Spirit Christology has precisely the reverse, then the obvious theological move is to combine the two, to develop a theology that integrates and combines the missions of the Son and the Spirit in the Incarnation. The spirit logo of Christology are not mutually exclusive, as Badcock explains, quotes him saying, Spirit Christology and Logos Christology are surely no more incompatible than spirit and logos themselves. According to strict Trinitarian orthodoxy, after all, the two are one as much as they are distinct. Very and this is in quote. Very broadly, such a proposal would have just uh, would have Jesus being ontologically the Logos substantially the Son of God, and yet the Son's divine nature does not act directly on Christ's humanity. Rather, the incarnate Son voluntarily submitted his actions, not subordinated his person, uh, not subordinated his person, 
to the spirit who guided and who guided and empowered him. Smell expresses this combined proposal assistantly. They quote him as saying, This new man, Jesus Christ, is the work of the Son of God, operating in his own human nature and the power and energy of the Holy Spirit. End quote. But where does one start in constructing such a proposal? A sp second spirit Christological proposition proposes some guidelines on how the Spirit and the Son can be understood to operate within the Incarnation. Perhaps the most famous and pivotal collection of phrases in the Chalcedonian Creed are the four quotes without. It says, quote, To be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeable, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. End quote. This is, uh, George Hunsinger explains that these four exclusionary phrases within the Creed do not, quote, um, isolate a point on the line that one either occupies or not. A democratis, a region, a democrates, a region in which there is more than one place to take up residence, end quote. The second proposition of a spirit Christology adopts a similar approach in that it democrates, democrats, I'm sorry, it democrates a region through a series of without clauses. Rather than specifying the incarnate relationship between the Son and Spirit in rigid and unyielding detail. And this section is without priority. So the first affirmation is that the identity and mission of the Spirit and the Son and the Incarnation are synchronous. That is, the Father sent both the Son and the Spirit into the world. So the Son that the Son could become incarnate and in the same the, the manner of this of their sending both during the period of Jesus' earthly incarnation and now in glory, neither has logical or chronological priority over the other. The following discussion first examines Christological proposals that prioritize the Son over the Spirit, followed by the reverse, and argues that neither option is satisfactory. It says Christological proposals that prioritize the Son over the Spirit, often abbreviated below as Son Priority Proposals, do uh, so either chronologically or logically. Chronologically, uh, chronological priority has the apostatic union occurring first and then at some point later, often identified as Jesus' baptism. The Holy Spirit empowers Jesus for ministry. This divides Jesus' life into two sections, a period where he had the Spirit empowering and another where he did not. For those periods where he had not was not empowered, chronological so, um, son priority proposals strike the same problems as the spirit docetic approaches before the indwelling how did jesus remain sinless how did he grow and develop spiritually the only possible answer is through the power of the divine logos which means that jesus has not truly experienced our humanity a more nuanced understanding avoids this challenge by giving the hypostatic union logical but not chronological priority jesus is first understood ontologically as the god man according to an exclusive Logos Christology, and then the indwelling spirit is layered on as an energizing, empowering influence. The scholastic doctrine of habitual sanctification provides an illustrative example. Uh, this doctrine distinguishes between Christ's essential satisfaction, uh, sanctification, uh, Jesus' intrinsic anointing by virtue of his ontological union, and his habitual sanctification, his specific functioning anointing by the spirit in order to live a life of godliness the habitual sanctifications are logically distinct from the essential grace or union and derivative in the sense that they flow from it this is uh, badcock critically assesses this approach as follows this is quote the intention was to provide a distinctive role in christology for the holy spirit in the relation to his to the humanity however the concept of human nature is involved was Effective. It allowed no growth or movement in Jesus' human relation to God, or as development and essential to human existence. Without it, one cannot be a human being in a physical, psychological, social, or we might add, spiritual sense. The problem was that in the end, the doctrine of the hypostatic union was introverted in a timeless and static rather than a dynamic and temporal way. There was a conception that did not permit the humanity of Christ be considered apart from its once for all assumption by the Logos. The 20th century Roman Catholic scholar uh, Herbert Molin insightfully developed this scholastic doctrine by 
positing that the Spirit gradually sanctified the human nature of Jesus so that it could be increasingly united with the Divine Logos. The Son, however, remains logically prior to the Spirit and the Incarnation because, according to Mullins' presuppositional acceptance of the Philoque, the Spirit proceeds from the Son in eternity. Consequently, the sanctification of Christ's human nature comes directly from the indwelling Spirit, but ultimately is derived from the hypothetic union with the Son, which enables the Spirit's presence. However, intractable problems remain. First, the biblical witness contrastingly suggests the hypostatic union was originally facilitated by the Spirit, Matthew 1, 18, 20. Second, it leaves unanswered the question of how the divine and human natures were originally united. If the Holy Spirit is required for increasing connection of the divine and human natures, how can it be absent in their initial union? Sun priority proposals assert that the Word was made flesh, but on how the Word was made flesh, they remain silent. The only way this question can be answered is by positing a role for the Holy Spirit in the Incarnation from the very beginning. Precisely that which Sun priority proposals with their a priori assumption that the hypostatic union is logically prior to the Spirit's indwelling, deny by definition. If proposals that prioritize the Son over the Spirit lead to inconsistencies, what about prioritizing the Spirit over the Son, abbreviated below as Spirit Priority Proposals? In a similar way, these can be categorized respectively into proposals that prioritize the Spirit chronologically and logically. An example of the former are Thoresis Christologies, Thorner, uh, which posit that the union of the Logos with the uh, human nature was a gradual process facilitated by the Spirit, resulting in a completely unified God-Man only and finally at the resurrection. But just as the chronological sun priority proposals led directly to the Spirit docetic challenges, so the chronological Spirit priority proposals led directly to the challenges of Spirit ebionism. In particular, pleurisis, pleurisis Christologies require Jesus, the man, to exist first, and consequently two, two clear and distinct persons within Jesus, a traditional Nestorianism. More announced Christological proposals that give the Spirit logical priority strike related problems. The thinking behind such proposals is that the Spirit enhances or enables human nature so that the Divine Son, kinoetically limited in some substantial way, can be incarnated as a human person. But the being concocted is neither truly God nor truly human. Jesus' human consciousness is simply a divine will stripped down to fit into the constraints of a mortal body. He is a tertium quid, occupying a space between divinity and humanity, but containing the core essence of neither. The issue here is conceptual. Spirit priority proposals view the incarnation as compositional, the quote, a substantial compositional union of two natures forming a new being, end quote. But in any such union, the divine being will overwhelm the human unless it is substantially limited. Consequently, spirit priority proposals are forced into limiting the divine being. The genius of the early church fathers, however, was that they did not view the hypostatic union as compositional, enabling them to make a logical but not existential distinction between person and nature. The these early crafters of orthodox theology, the Son of God became uh, becoming human, did not mean that the divine nature must become human, or vice versa. As the Chalcedonian Creed states, it quotes, The difference in natures being by no means removed because of the union, end quote. Kenosis thus occurs through the Logos, taking on a human nature rather than giving up some portion of the Son's inherent divinity. As such, compositional problems can only be avoided if the human nature of Christ is viewed as an hypostatic or in hypostatic, that is, if its existence depends on the hypostatic union, which spirit priority proposals deny by definition. Summarizing the first clause in this second spirit Christological proposition affirms that the identity and missions of the spirit and the son in the incarnation are logically and chronologically synchronous without priority but is regular, regularly noted Christological conclusions 
uh, Trinitarian implications. For example, T.F. Torrance writes, uh, quote, We have to remember the inseparable relation in the Bible of Numa and Logos, where the basic conception is of the living breath of God uttering his word, so that the reception of the Spirit is through the word. The Spirit thus com uh, comes from the Father in the name of the Son uttering the word made flesh, end quote. Uh, Protestant theologians Mike Habert Pevitz have recently drawn a direct link between the synchronous spirit Christological insight and an imminent Trinitarian understanding where the Father begets the Son in or by the Spirit in a single unified action. Such exploration, however, did not only happen in the direction from the economy to the imminent Trinity, uh, not only should the insights of spirit Christology be read into our understanding of who God is in himself, but the perhaps altered doctrines of the imminent trinity should be read back into the economy to accurately inform our apprehension of the incarnate Son, and so too uh, the nature of our own existence. Accurate and rich understandings of the imminent trinity will lead to accurate and rich understandings of Christology, together with other theological loci. But equally inadequate conceptions of the imminent trinity will lead directly to inadequate Christologies, and it is here that the two final clauses of the second proposition are encountered, an overemphasis on God's numerical unity leads directly to Christological proposals that insufficiently distinguish between the Son and the Spirit within the Incarnation, and as overemphasis on God's personal plurality leads directly to Christological proposals where the identity and missions of the Spirit and the Son and the Incarnation are, in, are insufficiently interdependent. Spirit Christology does affirm the need for the identity and missions of the Son and the Spirit to be not just without priority, but also without confusion and without separation. Now the next section, <coughs> sorry, the next section, the next section is uh, without confusion and uh, goes over Yudhichanism, spiritual Yudhichanism. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there.